And we are live! At least I believe we are! Greetings and salutations, beautiful beans, and welcome to a very, very, very special Saturday stream because we have Amanda! Amanda, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful this morning, Janet. Thank you so much for asking and having me on. Oh my goodness, you know I drag you on with giant hooks <laughs> if I could. I mean, we'd have Amanda here every week if we could, but of course she's a very busy bean. <laughs> We are, of course, kicking off our Adventure April week, month rather, yep, Adventure April month in style. Hi. We have Amanda who's come to talk to us about one shots, how to write them, structure them, what should go in, what shouldn't go in, how you GN them. And uh, we're even going to be talking just a little bit about publishing as well. Oh yeah, drop in the cup. Oh yeah, just just Very drop in subtle the product placement hit. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I literally just use this mug every day because I'm disgusting. Because it's massive. The it world really needs is. more giant mugs full of coffee. That this is, is my why belief. I'm so caffeinated all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not a mug if you can't fit a whole pint in there. That's my belief anyway. If you anyway. put your fist in it, right. then I don't right. want it. <laughs> if it's not the size of my face, it's not a <laughs> cup of coffee. Yes. Get good, son. <laughs> Yes. So we very calm ladies are going to be talking all about one shots today. Make sure that you get those questions in. If you look at that flaming anvil right underneath the chat window, you will see all sorts of things that you can do. And one of your finest flaming anvil points, which you get just by hanging out with us on stream, uh, will get you a question. Yes, it will. We'll be answering our questions in ooh, about 45 minutes. But first, let me introduce my guest properly because she's far too modest to introduce herself. We have here the senior designer from Wizards of the Freaking Coast. Yes, this is the lady bringing you the good stuff, bringing you Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Before that, she worked with Paizo. She was instrumental in getting Starfinder out. You did a lot for Starfinder, didn't you? Yeah, I was a co-creator of Starfinder, if you like fancy words. Uh, from your brain! From yeah, your brain! <laughs> All the weird things in there. Yeah, that was totally somebody else and not me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it there, was are, there are dinosaurs <laughs> in Starfinder. Just saying. Oh, there are dinosaurs. There are cybernetic dragons. There are all kinds of crazy aliens, and you can be a player character using almost any single one of them, which is a, a fun challenge to have to fulfill. You can have an entire party full of psychic gas bags if you want. <laughs> I was just about to say you can easily have an entire party full of different species of invertebrates. That was that the thing that got me sold. That is actually a description of one of my Starfinder home games. We were invertebrate investigations and we were a noir style detective office solving crimes and being invertebrates <laughs> and slightly oh. slimy. Some of us were slightly slimy. A sousson of slime. Just, just a sousson, <laughs> just a tiny little bit. I love yeah. it. I freaking love it. So guys, this is Amanda Hammond. She is amazing. We are so happy to have her here. In addition to all of that, she's also just a glorious human being and you can go follow her on Twitter. Yes, you can. Uh, the links are going to be dropped right down there. So uh, yeah, go follow Amanda. She's awesome. Yes. Uh, let's jump straight into our questions because I have many. Obviously, we are running Adventure April this month. We are asking all of our beans to participate by writing a one shot. So let's get right in. What's the difference between a one shot and an adventure in terms of the approach? Like, what's the difference when you're when you're writing it? I, I would have to say that uh, the difference is that a one shot has got to be self-contained. The definition of a one shot is that you can complete it in one session. So you have to keep in mind that time constraint is one of your uh, your biggest enemies. It can also be on your side if you're leveraging it um, in a correct way. But you've got to make sure that there is a story that can be completed from beginning to end uh, in a very compressed time period. Uh, we'll talk probably a little bit about this later on, but having a very strict sense of what the story is um, and a beginning and end is really important. And then you can kind of fill in the details as needed, even, even during gameplay, or you can have sort of notes on options of things to fill in depending on the player's choices. Um, but really making sure that it has a beginning and an end is the most important thing. Mm. Absolutely. What's your favorite length for a one shot? What, what do you think the sweet spot is? 
I would say that um, it really somewhat depends on the type of system that you're using, but in general, probably three to four hours, I think is the sweet spot because you can really tell a story. You can have a very climactic uh, ending set piece if you want. You can have a, a villain who's seated throughout the whole thing very uh, strongly. Um, and accomplish that without it feeling like you haven't really done anything, uh, which maybe like a two or a three hour might tend to be. Sure, absolutely. Oh, great advice. So what are the core elements that should be in a one shot? Our beans are writing one shots not only for themselves to play, but also for other people to play. So this is a really important thing to consider in, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, it's, it is very important to make sure that you have got I think a very evocative setting. And I mean, where the action is actually taking place. What I think is most effective is primarily using one map uh, if you are using maps uh, for your games. So you can certainly have uh, like a, a role playing scene setting type of encounter at the very beginning that's sort of laying out uh, what's going on with the characters. If you've got pre-generated characters, you can kind of allow people to fall into uh, the role play elements of what roles those characters are playing and how the story might be interacting with that. But once you get into the meat of the of the adventure, having one place that the PCs can explore or having everything just literally on one physical map, or if you're on VTTs, uh, you know, having it be very easy for the players to navigate that on one page, I think is going to save you a lot of time and really help players become immersed. So having a good sense of place is very important when you're starting out. In addition to what I mentioned before, which is that really, uh, that really strong, cohesive story, uh, the really, I, I hate to use the word straightforward, but um, a very uh, evocative like problem that is to be solved and having it be apparent early on in the adventure that there's something that the PCs are having to do and that once that is done that that's going to be the accomplishment of the adventure that's very important as well. Do you go as far as having sort of set scenes that you like to see so like so many encounters or so many this or so many that? Actually, yes, for sure. Um, and again, you know, it depends a little bit on the system that folks are running. There are all kinds of systems out there that are really well suited for one shots. Uh, very rules light um, systems like uh, like a dread role playing system, which literally just uses the Jenga tower as the mechanical resolution. That's a really strong um, thing for using one shot. That's because you can focus on the story. And then whenever the players want to do something, they pull a brick and they see if they're successful um, or not. Um, but, uh, you know, rules, more rules, heavy systems. This is more important. You have to understand about how long each encounter will take uh, in a more rules heavy system because you've got to resolve those encounters, especially when they're combat encounters. So in general, I would say with those more rules heavy systems, that you've probably got three to four encounters uh, in a four hour session. I would say plan for, and in fact, you know, I, I have done this, especially with organized play type scenarios, uh, expect that your players in four hours will get through three encounters and then have a fourth or even a fifth encounter that's an optional if they're blowing through things or if they're skipping over an encounter in a way that would make sense that the next one wouldn't happen because they've done something to circumvent this challenge that they would normally be facing. So yeah, assuming three counters sort of baseline and then maybe one or two more just depending on time. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, that was a question I was going to ask you is, is do you include sort of extra optional bits in order to mm -hmm. help people when they're when they're trying to make time, essentially? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's probably why story is the most important part of a one shot and really knowing what it is you want the players to be able to accomplish and what you want the reveal to be, if there's going to be a reveal or what you want them to have overcome um, or what you want the big twist to be uh, in the session. One shots are perfect for that, but you have to know what the end point is because then you can more easily fill in oh well you know as they're going down uh the as they're going up the ladder you know getting to the the new mont right and uh, the climax well there are things that would logically happen and here's how we can fill in those blanks having like a, an idea in your notes basically written out is really positive Fantastic. So I'm going to pick out a few things that you've said there and just e expand on those, if that's all right. Sure. The first is you've talked about a hook. Um, mm -hmm. How important is the hook in a one shot? Because oh, it's, it's not something you want the players to say no to, right? Right, exactly. 
Exactly. It's very important that, you know, starting out even in that early scene setting role playing um, situation that I described at the very beginning of the one shot that there's a really clear idea of what the threat is, what the challenge is, what uh, what needs to be solved throughout the course of the one shot, and having the players always going in that direction is is very important. And you know, it really depends on how loosey goosey this um, one shot is, whether it, you know it's a homebrew or it's something that you're you know writing and play testing because you're you're going to publish it as a module. Um, if the players just don't hook onto what hook you have in front of them and they really go for something else. That can be an indication that, well, maybe you should be writing about this other thing that's more interesting, um, or it can also just be a way for you to creatively solve the problems that the players are always, uh, you know, throwing at the wall like catapults, chucking, you know, giant rocks at your wall of a story. Um, you can help to, to overcome that um, by just seeing the strange weird things that players do. Cool. So we talked about plot hook. It's the first thing your players are probably going to see. Mm, you can expect... Absolutely whether they've got pre-generated characters that you have made for the one shot mm -hmm. or they've yeah. made their own as part of the system. Yeah. Um, the first thing they're really gonna fall over is that hook, that inciting incident, uh, as, as authors call it, a call to action. It's the thing that gets them into the story. Yes, absolutely. We've talked about the end bit as well, the climax. Tell us a little bit more about, about how to make a great climax for a one shot. Ooh, yeah, so how to make the, a great climax can really come down to what that hook is, right? Because you you want to, as a storyteller, think about how are you going to just drip drab these crumbs of uh, information or have reveals happen as the PCs are overcoming certain challenges. And you want to think about what all that leads into, right? So having a great climax can be anything from revealing that there is one major villain that maybe has had a presence throughout the entire one shot and they have now finally confronted this person and there's a big fight as that villain may or may not have seen them coming and had lots of crazy things uh, planned out in their in their lair in their super secret uh, super villain lair <laughs> Uh, or maybe they are conducting some kind of ritual or maybe they're, uh, you know, their plans are sort of in motion. Maybe it's a Dr. Frankenstein situation and they're just about to hit the lightning. Uh, so the flesh golem can come to life and the final encounter is about the players stopping that and interrupting this horrible plan and defeating the bad guys. Um, but really sort of having an idea, you know, of what it is that you want that final confrontation to be and the cinematic elements for me as a writer are really important and, and satisfying and I found players have really responded well to you know they kick down the door to the villain's final layer and it turns out there's this huge laboratory and you know because I always write horror there's like maybe a bunch of body parts that are all hung up on meat hooks and it's you know it is a Dr. Frankenstein and they're putting together this flesh golem and now you're horrified at this scene and you can't even stop to really let that sink in because, oh my God, they're just about to hit the lightning and you've right. got to stop the flesh golem. <laughs> right. So I think with, with the climax, it has to be that culmination. It's the culmination, everything that you've been dropping seeds for, everything that you've been, yeah. in terms of genre, in terms of tone, in terms yep. of themes for the one shot, it really all has to come together in this very big way, like really dialing it up to 11, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, go big or go home. It is a one shot. You do not need your players to have those PCs be available for another session. One thing that I'm a big fan of, and I've done this in a number of published adventures, but as well as just one shots that I run at conventions or with my friends when I'm traveling, um, I love writing pre-generated characters that are keyed specifically to the story of the one shot. Mm. So that it's, it is very much like writing a story. It's like writing sort of a fiction novel and these are the protagonists. And so you can put things in the one shot that speak to those specific characters, or you can use it as a mechanical resolution element when, for example, you need somebody to be an engineer because you know that there's this big sort of mechanical thing going on. There's a big, you know, steamwork situation and one of the characters has got to use engineering to tinker with the steamworks while there's another uh, combat encounter going on where there's little robots attacking the rest of the party. You can create a pregen that is the engineer, right? And somebody can play that character. Um, you know, using the archetypical roles of a story is really helpful in, in one shot as well. It's another thing that I do all the time. Um, I like say, oh, 
you know, there's somebody who's an aristocrat and this is somebody who will be really well known and there will be doors that I expect will be open through role playing that are meant to be opened because it moves the story forward. Mm. You know, for example, really having everything be that like tight and well tuned is a really fun experience for people. Very cool. Very cool. And I th- I'm sure there are a lot of authors who want to take a crack at this for the first time, who are thinking, thank God, she says it's like writing a novel, and which is yeah. is ab- absolutely, there's a lot of those elements in it because unlike a, an adventure, which we all know, the players, they make some choices that you don't expect. Yep. Like if, if there is secret choice number three, they have found secret choice number four, which you didn't even consider, right? Yeah. Um, with a one shot, there's not time for that. So you really are sending people through a story. So it, in many ways, it is so much more like writing a novel. But on that note, how do you create the illusion that it is not railroaded? Because I think with one shots, of course, there's always going to be a little bit of that. When we talk about railroading, we mean literally it feels like the story is on tracks and you don't have agency as a player. How yeah. can you avoid that? Or how can you avoid the illu- How can you kind of hide that essentially? So I think you've really hit the nail on the head there, Janet. It's not so much about avoiding it. It's about hiding it. It's about obfuscation and making up (laughs) stuff as the GM and making it look like you know what you're doing when maybe you don't. (laughs) Spoilers, none of us know what we're doing. We're making up everything. You're doing fantastic if you feel like you're making everything up. (laughs) Yes, yes, this is true. um, Yeah, exactly. So I think really going to that point, It's being careful about the random one-off name drops that you might put into the one-shot because this is a one-shot. You might be running it in your own campaign setting. You you might be running it in a different campaign setting, something that's published. You have to be careful um, when you're dropping like the name of the tavern, the name of, you know, the haberdasher, the name of, you know, something else as you're just describing the scene and setting the scene. The things that are really dangerous for you as the GM in a constrained time situation like a one shot is when the player goes, oh, well, you mentioned the, that, that haberdasher and it's like, there, we just found some really strange clothing and I wonder if they know what that is. You really run the risk of the party then going, okay, well, let's just, you know, we've got a little bit of time here. Let's go off and ask that haberdasher and then you have got to figure out how to keep that from derailing your entire session put the players back on the track that you need them to and uh, still be able to tell your story. Um, So one thing you can do is really just have that haberdasher then have some connect to connection to the actual plot. Say maybe they would be there, but they've actually like been kidnapped or something. And there's like a 20 minute role play scene where the players figure out, oh my gosh, they're actually being held in this thing. And now they have even more motivation to go deal with the villain that's at hand. Another way to do that is actually create a ticking clock so that the players are not as inclined to go do these little small side quests or to take their time and do a bunch of research and things that can throw your game out of whack. Basically just say, oh, well, yeah, you can do that, but there are hostages that are being killed every hour or something like that. That's a very extreme version, right? Um, But, oh, you could do that, but you did find out that this ritual takes an hour to complete and you are trying to figure out where this ritual is happening so you can stop it. Do you think you have time? And most players will go, oh my gosh, no. And then they won't go do the thing. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So I love that because you've given us a piece of advice as a GM and a piece of advice as a writer or a Mm -hmm. GM, right? So you can can shunt the players back on track by reinventing connections where there aren't connections as a GM. So if you're looking at the one shot material, the players have gone that way where there is nothing. You can sort of transpose something over there to get them back onto the main story as a game master. As a writer of any genre, by the way, ticking clocks, so useful. And again, they (laughs) up the tension, they make Your players stay on track because, as Amanda said, you know this thing is happening at midnight. You don't know where it's happening. You keep hearing the clock in the background bong another hour. Holy crap, we are running out of time. That that is a great way to keep your players on track and raise the tension all at the same time. So, you know, when you're you're writing your one shots, definitely something to to consider, I think. Yeah. Uh, And uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Talk talk to me. Talk to me. (laughs) I was thinking that another fun thing to do when there's a ticking clock situation is to really reinforce that. And because it's a one shot, you can do things like 
uh, create little subsystems or you can create little mechanical elements that reinforce what you are saying as a GM. So as a writer, it can be very fun to come up with a fairly, you know, a small footprint in the book or the publication that you're writing, but something like, oh, for every, uh, for every, you know, 30 minutes that elapses in the game time, something happens and having mm-hmm. that really reinforce what your story is, you know, say it is uh, some, there is some kind of ritual that's being conducted and it's, uh, it is sucking the life force out of the people in this town. And so the PCs have got to stop it before, uh, you know, the ritual is complete and all life force is immediately sucked out of everybody. And then there's a super demi lich or whatever. And now he's crazy and he's going everywhere. Uh, you can have little things happen, little flavorful things that don't necessarily affect the PC's abilities, but that are affecting the world around them or a flavor thing happening to them where it's like, okay, every 30 minutes, uh, you know, you see somebody just kind of like uh, collapse in a catatonic state uh, or, uh, you know, there are um, uh, animals, right, that are sort of circumventing around everywhere and all of a sudden they just kind of stop and they block your path and they stare at you in this creepy way. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can have happen, but a little bit of reinforcement is fun as a writer. (laughs) Absolutely. And those kinds of sort of mini systems, mini games, Mm -hmm. uh, again, they're upping the tension, they're raising the stakes, they're making everything feel more dramatic. It is a one shot. You get it. It's like one punch man, right? Yeah. It does one thing. It punches. You You get one punch. Exactly. And if terrible things are happening to the PCs during the one shot, that's fine because they don't have to come back. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I have died in one shots and it was terrible and tragic. But do you know what? I wasn't that attached to the character because it was a one shot character. These things happen. Yep. <laughs> Before we go on, I would like to remind you that we have 10 minutes left on the raffle for this sweet bean. This is the Blood Grotto micro setting system agnostic with art by the glorious Kaora. And uh, I may or may not have written some squirrels mm. that rip your head off as well um, as part of that. Head ripping squirrels from head Janet. Ripping. Oh my God. Yeah. Get in on yeah. this, you guys. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, there's some stuff in there. Uh, my style is beautiful, multicolored crystal ferns that hum as you pass them and squirrels that rip your brains out. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is very much the setting. There's a lot of things in there. It's very fun, very cool. Exclamation point raffle to get your very own PDF copy. Oh, yeah. Um, so we've talked about core cool elements of a one shot. Um, I'd love to flirt through encounters because it tends to go plot hook encounters of increasing things yeah sometimes a plot twist for now mm-hmm. yes so what kind of encounters are good for a one shot and what is an encounter at its heart well so an encounter at its heart is any kind of challenge that the pieces have to overcome usually using mechanics but not always so think of an encounter like a scene And a scene can include anything from combat, which, you know, is very common with the mechanics heavy systems that we're discussing here, um, to like a skill challenge, uh, which can, you know, be like, it can be a dance, it can be a race, it can be uh, anything that has got a fairly quick sort of beginning and end. And there's a way that you can be successful or not successful. Or the third option, my favorite, kind of successful with some sort of downside or upside. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, or, you know, you can also do a scene that is purely a role-playing scene, but I think the thing to keep in mind is that there's got to be something that comes out of it. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it can sort of go on and on. There's got to be an objective, right, yeah. where the players learn the information that they've come to learn or they don't. Um, and, you know, speaking as a, as a GM, sometimes even if the players aren't doing what you've written or what it says, as in the module that they need to do to be successful sometimes it's like oh but they've done this other thing they need this information to go on they get the information um or they or it's very obvious what they need to do to then get the information because otherwise you're going to get too bogged down and you just do not have the time in a one shot to yeah. worry about that absolutely something that i like to do is i add an extra secret winning condition so yes you can get the thing but if you're really rude to this npc then that's all you get if you're nice to him, he also Word. gives you the secret weapon or he shows yes. you the back door or, you know, the, there's all sorts of sort of yes and conditions you can do or yep. no but conditions you can do that yes. you can write in there. It's just a, a, a line 
essentially mm -hmm. so it doesn't take a lot of space in your in your word count in your one shot or what have you Absolutely. um that just helps people feel like they have a little bit more agency again it goes back to that railroading thing like there are consequences mm -hmm. to their actions even in this itty bitty little one shot world yeah absolutely yeah very very much so and i think you know having the we, we won't say the illusion because it's not exactly an illusion but having sort of that sense that whatever the players are going to do there will be some effect out of it i think is very important because the most obstructive thing that you can have especially in a time constrained situation is to just say well no that doesn't work and mm -hmm. then have the players kind of sit back there and go, oh, well, we're not really sure what we should do, or they're completely off the rails. Yeah. So, you know, the module doesn't cover this, um, or, you know, you've not thought of it as the writer, uh, then that's going to disengage people. And then that's sort of the beginning of the end. So you really just want to roll with whatever it is that the players do. And like you said, as a writer, you don't necessarily have to use a lot of word count to work with those contingencies. There are, I, I would say, like, saying saying things along the lines of this is outside the scope of this adventure is more important than spending a whole bunch of word count dealing with all of the different contingencies. You can sort of briefly say if the players do this, this, or this, or they might overcome this challenge in another way, be yeah. creative. That's the important type of word count to get in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was reading again, the very excellent game design by Cobalt Press. Uh, the Cobalt Guide to Game Design. And one of the things that Wolfgang says in his very first essay is make sure that you are not using too many words when you're yep. writing. Like yep. you don't need to use too many words. So make sure you're spending those words wisely. Yep. Some ways they could overcome this include, or they might do something else. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not writing in absolutes is very important. And because, and I know your writers will appreciate this, Janet, uh, that leaves you more word count to do a fancy cinematic set pieces, which are my favorite things ever as a writer. You can write in all of the details of all of the wondrous, horrifying, strange occurrences that are happening in your big end set piece or your beginning set piece or something in the middle that is the turning point of your adventure. Spend your word count on the load bearing stuff there and don't get bogged down in the details. Yeah, absolutely. You want to save that word count for where it counts. Essentially, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, <laughs> any tips for making your one shot the most enjoyable it can be for your players? Because at the end of the day, we all come to the table to have some fun. What are your tips for making sure it's fun? Oh, for making sure it's fun, I really, I got to say, you've got to spend the attention on the pacing, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to really, uh, as, a, as a writer, you've got to try to, again, spend that word count on the exciting things that are happening. But when you're running things, whether you're a writer who's playtesting your adventure or you're jamming something that's published or you're jamming something that you've written that's out uh, as an event or what have you, you really want to, uh, you know, like, focus on the big stuff, right? Like make sure that those encounters have got interesting things that will stick out in people's minds, put interesting choices in front of the players uh, that are constrained within those self-contained encounters that are leading to your end. Ah, oh, my glasses are not in my hair. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> here is a, a CR18 encounter, by the way. Yeah, it, it, does, it does eat things, <laughs> including but not limited to hair brushes. Uh, <laughs> hair a mimic? That's amazing. I've been trying for years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just we formed a symbiotic relationship, but the hair is driving, which is a little bit concerning. <laughs> you can have some strangling hair, right? That's a, that's a Pathfinder witch oh, spell, I yes. think. Yes, <laughs> that would be amazing. That, you see, that's what I need in my life now. <laughs> The one shot. It's when you get shrunk down and you have to navigate Janet's hair before it eats you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, That's a um, terrible one shot. Don't write that. <laughs> oh man, no. You see, now I now I'm writing it in my head as we talk. This is terrible. <laughs> this is this always happens to me. I mean, that's kind of fun though, right? It's like you know, there's a giant, there's a giant situation, and you've been you know dropped down into this world, and you have to escape, yeah. and it's like the borrowers kind of. You yeah, know, and it's got like gotta... carpet people vibes. Yeah, one of the Freaking things. love that. You got to climb up the giantess's hair so that you can like jump off into some kind of, I don't know, portal that helps you get closer to home. <laughs> I love that. I freaking love that. <laughs> um, so we've talked about making them enjoyable. I have a quick question for you now. You can answer yes. anything you like. What is uh -oh. your favorite one shot Ooh. and why? 
Oh, my favorite one shot that I've written. Wow. Um, that I've written or that I've run. Do you care? Can Anything, I just... whatever. I'm looking for recommendations for my beams for great one shots that they can uh, they can research basically. Oh, right. Um, okay. Oh, does it need to be something that's published? It would be helpful if it's published. It would be helpful if it's published. Okay, because I run a lot of one shots that are like a thing that I put together and run for a small group of people at a convention or a place that I'm traveling or something. And they're so weird and out there. And most of those are my favorite and they've never seen the light of day for publishing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. But so there's actually, there's a good one shot that I wrote for the 50th anniversary of Gen Con that's published. Cool. Um, and it's called Heroes for High Delve and it is um, an acquisitions adventure. So it's geared toward folks who uh, haven't played lots of D20 games, maybe have uh, a little bit of familiarity, but not a lot. Um, and it uh, is a very foundational, you are, uh, this is one where there are pregens for this um, nice. adventure. Yeah. So you are playing um, basically like youngsters in this village uh, where um, spoilers, I guess, don't matter because people are running things, but uh, the um, uh, the sort of protector of this village is a gold dragon in disguise of a human. And nice. sometimes, yeah, yeah. And there's a super cool end scene where you uh, are thanked by this uh, this woman in her gold dragon form, and you get to ride on the, on her back and sort of like sail back into town as the returning nice. heroes after you've adventured down into a cave and you've you found this this MacGuffin situation. Anyway, I'm basically giving away the whole plot. Um, but That's it is cool. super fun. Yeah, it's super fun. Uh, it's um, in its published form. It's very difficult to kind of find, but you can probably find uh, text of it uh, somewhere. And uh, it is it is geared toward uh, learning and teaching other people how to how to play the game. So if you're looking for a cool adventure to get people into various systems, that's a decent one. Um, yeah, Fantastic. I've heard lots of lots of fun. Uh, I want to tell you about my games. I'm one of those nerds. Oh my god, <laughs> honey, we're all one of those nerds. That's why we yeah. got it in the first place. Would you be writing for WotC if you weren't one of those nerds? Would I be running Wild Anvil if I were not one of those nerds? Of course yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've run so many weird one shots, Janet. I ran a one shot a few years ago that was called, uh, it was a Starfinder one shot and it's called Love and Tragic Death in a Space-Time Revolution. And everybody was playing sentient magical raptors and they were an opera company with an opera singer. You and wrote this for me. You wrote this for me. <laughs> Before you even know me, knew me, <laughs> yeah, me a one Back shot. In like 2017, yeah, and they were on their way to one of their opera concerts, and their their ship got ensnared and pulled down uh, into a research facility that was essentially the villain was Dr. Robotnik. If you've ever played <laughs> the Sonic games, who was experimenting on uh, magical uh, creatures, magical uh, like animal type creatures, to see if he could pull out their their different abilities, their different uh, species abilities and you know put them into like mega bots and they had to they had to go through this facility where they were captured uh and uh there was a role-playing encounter that actually didn't end up happening in that session but there was a an assistant uh who you know could have helped them out and they didn't even get to her they went the other side of the facility <laughs> But they then ended up having to fight the Dr. Robotnik character who was in a giant mech and who was shooting out missiles that mimicked the different abilities that he had taken out of the other creatures he had captured. <laughs> uh, the chat is pretty certain that um, that uh, this is this is secretly my plot, not yours, because <laughs> it is so me, I can't even. Just one second, I would like to shout out the winner of this raffle, which is DH. Acheron, I are you in the chat? DH Acheron, if you are, you must say something to claim your prize because we need to go on to the second raffle. Cat tax. Yes. <laughs> cat tax. So much cat tax today. Uh, it's when she starts smarming and purring into the microphone that you get the real ASMR treat. Mm. Yeah, it's whole thing. The insightful discussion on RPGs, save for the ASMR cat purrs. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what they're all here for. That's, that's why they come. We know it. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> Coco is really the star. Um, so you mentioned using one shots to get people into a new system or a new yes. setting. This mm -hmm. is one of the best reasons to use our one shot people. Can you give me, can you give us, can you give everybody some advice on what to include if you are using a one shot for that specific purpose? Because it's, it's different than just like, hey, everybody knows the system. Let's play a cool game. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've actually run a number of projects that are meant to be acquisition products, both for the GM and for the players. So geared more toward people who are new to GMing and getting into that mindset of like, what is it that you sort of need to know? And uh, what do you need to reference? And what do you need to keep in mind? And reminding people of options uh, and tools in your tool bag as a GM that you wouldn't necessarily need to remind veterans, but newer folks just don't quite have the experience yet to have that bag be uh, quite so heavy. So the th uh, a good thing to make sure to include is like just little rules references where you might say, you know, just a one-off like, oh, um, you know, uh, the PCs can enter the room in a number of different ways, making sure that you list out stuff like DCs if you're playing 5e or Pathfinder or Starfinder, um, to have that be at hand so that they don't either have to go look it up or maybe not realize that you can look it up and just make up a number and, you know, and have that be um, more difficult than it should be listing all the little mechanics where you might not normally do so. And then I used a lot of sidebars in the projects that I've run nice. that are geared toward new GMs where it's just like uh, things that you wouldn't normally maybe use a lot of word count on. I, I know we're sort of contradicting ourselves from, from Ooh, earlier. This is, it's, a, it's a very specific use case, right? Yeah, but just calling out like, oh, it it is very likely that the, that the PCs might, instead of fighting the ogre, might decide to try to circumvent the ogre stealthily or might try to befriend the ogre because like new players love to try to talk to, to and make friends with monsters, which I completely am in, a fan of. <laughs> But just like laying out and like saying things that might be obvious to more experienced GMs uh, is really a good tip for for the writers to say like, oh, players might decide to do this. And in this case, here's a good way to resolve that. Um, really sort of like thinking like a new GM, casting your mind back to, you know, what took you by surprise or what you think players might do. It's, it's hard to predict player shenanigans, but I think it, it's sort of a, a skill, sort of a learned skill. Projecting that into your writing can be really helpful when you're trying to write an acquisitions product. Yeah, absolutely. Do you recommend doing it like a rules light version or do you recommend, you know, putting it all in there? Oh, do you mean for when you're writing for new GMs? Well, specifically for for sort of a, a one shot for a starter set or a one shot to like get people into into a new system or a new setting. Oh, sure. I recommend putting as much of the rules as you can and because that does uh, eat up a lot of word count, sometimes just pointing, cross-referencing to the product. So if you're using mm -hmm. a starter set, you've got a player's handbook uh, in there, you've got a, a DMG in there. So yeah. you have other things you can reference to where you might not normally say, and the rules for breaking objects can be found on page 56. Just mm -hmm. saying that using, you know, I don't know, 15 words to kind of call that out is yeah. a lot more helpful for newer people than you might realize. Yeah, absolutely. And again, guys, if you're if you're publishing digitally, of course, you can link to your World Anvil page. You can just be like, click here, you will find the rules. I see um, what you did. So smooth. <laughs> it wasn't even supposed to be, but you know, everybody here is using World Anvil. So do you know what? Yeah. <laughs> World Anvil is wonderful. Oh, I have uh, actually a game later today, right after this interview, in which the GM uses World Anvil and asks hey. me tell you that he's a big fan and you guys have a wonderful product so, oh, that's so sweet we're gonna go play in a weird west game that weird is powered west. by world anvil <laughs> nice as far as i know that's a world anvil and foundry game isn't it it is a world anvil and foundry game and our, our mutual friends uh alexander over at cobalt press is in that game as well and i'm pretty sure we've told you stories about the weird stuff that we do in that game <laughs> I hear such weird stories. I am so intrigued about this game. Oh. I'm so in love with this game. Like just the concept, the bits that I hear. Yep. And that space uh, opera game that I was telling you about with the magical raptors, he played the opera singer <laughs> in that. And oh my like, God. had the best opera singing voice. I got to tell you. <laughs> The best accent for them when they were talking in their native language, which is Hanakin. So it's a language that, of course, they're all that same race. They can all speak and understand. None of the evil scientists know what that is because, you know, they're off on another part of the galaxy. So, so he's got them talking to each other in this really like rough, nasty, cockney sounding accents. And then when they talk to the scientists, they sound in totally differently. It's great. Oh my God. I love that. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god we gotta play some games amanda 
I have so many stories I can tell you about the weird con games that I run and at some point they may or may not make it into print but so far <laughs> it's like <laughs> if you want to if you want to experience the craziness I got the craziness <laughs> Oh my god, I freaking love this. So we've talked about one shots as part of a starter pack, and we've talked about um, sort of how to manage that. In terms of system or setting, we, and you know, I like to sense check our advice with our guests sometimes. We advise including the USP of the setting, so that unique hook of the setting, somehow including it or hinting to it in the starter set. Would is that something that you think is important as well? Um, I would say so. Yeah. Um, you know, we, you start to run into some potential concerns because it really depends on, you know, is this going to be a published product that's from another company? Are you, if it's not, are you setting something in another IP that another company owns? I would say, I think, you know, writers are going to understand, you know, how ownership and IP and stuff like that works, but as much as you can, referencing things that are setting specific that would affect the way the game is resolved and the way the one shot works that is the most important thing it's not important to mention something about the continent way across the ocean that is cool and might be like a flavor detail but doesn't affect anything in the actual one shot that's not important but things like this city has got no temples because religion is outlawed in this setting okay that is important to mention and that's something that you should work in there Awesome. So we've talked a lot about what should be in a one shot. We've talked about mm. hooks and climaxes and encounters and plot twists. We've talked about pre-gen characters. We've talked about, you know, introducing people with a one shot to a new system or setting, which mm. is all awesome. What do people, in your opinion, get wrong in one shots? And what is your tip for helping our beams to avoid that mistake? Oh, sure. So I would say, um, kind of piggybacking off of what we were talking about earlier, having, having encounters or having too much ancillary information that can, uh, that can provide ways for the players to run off of track, that is probably the biggest yeah. uh, obstacle that I see uh, one shot happening in one shots. In some ways, um, organized play scenarios uh, for Ventures League um, or... Um, Pathfinder Society or Starfinder Society, those are primarily governed by the rules of one shots, right? Because there's a certain set of, there's a time slot that has, they have to take place in. A lot of times they're happening at conventions or in other group play situations. Uh, you've only got uh, so many encounters, you know, that you've got to get through. You've got to get to the end. You have to find out whether the PCs are successful. Running a lot of stuff like that can really give you a good sense, um, both as a writer and as a GM, of how much you can fit into the time slot and what type of encounters tend to really encourage players to do things like go off of the rails or, or um, you know, just doing things that are going to take up so much time that they then can't get to the stuff that you've got planned. Um, yeah, being too open-ended is really... Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see. And like I, I mentioned before, dr name dropping too much stuff that to, to players, you know, uh, who are very smart, pick up on them immediately and go, oh, the GMS have told me this for a reason. Let's figure out what's going on with it. When you as the GM just went, oh my God, I literally just made that up and this has nothing to do with the story, but they don't know that, right? Yeah. So trying to be mindful um, and not dropping anything in randomly um, can happen. I just thought of a thing that is actually kind of contradicting myself, but not really. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so we are talking about having that setup scene, right? The the scene that's laying out what's happening um, yeah. in the one shot. The very classic thing is everybody's meeting up at some kind of tavern to uh, you know investigate some kind of job that you know they've gotten through a guild or some sort of quest that they've gotten from a mutual acquaintance who's an NPC or something like that. That scene for me on one specific occasion has taken so long that I was actually streaming this game. This was um, an old Pathfinder 2 game a long time ago, yeah. like in the playtest days. <laughs> that scene can take so long that you can eat up a big chunk of your slot that you've got for a one shot. So yeah. what I did to solve that problem, I know I said, oh, don't make up a whole bunch of stuff because then players can go off. I created an NPC who was sitting in the corner of the tavern and was basically like heckling them to get them to go off to 
the place that they needed to go because the place they needed to go was where the one shot was going to happen. It was in this old manor hall called Somberfell Hall. Um, it was a, a scenario called Affair at Somberfell Hall. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, players, I need you to get the heck out of the tavern and go to the hall. <laughs> go check out why this professor hasn't been heard from in, you know, like three months or however long yeah. it was. And they were just like talking about things amongst themselves and trying to figure out like all of these little details and they all had made their characters and they were role playing and it was really awesome and they were getting into character, but it was taking so, so long. They ended up creating who was a, a drunken dude who was over in the corner <laughs> uh, who yeah. then ended up like, you know, uh, goading them in that direction and they ended up adopting this character because he thought he was this you know like beautiful singer in this bard and he was really just kind of shrieking and kind of sounded like this <laughs> and he ended up being like their best friend on the, one of the MVPs of the entire session and he doesn't Amazing. exist in the written version of the adventure <laughs> yeah I think um, whipping out an NPC to get things moving is a yeah. very very good piece of gming advice just in general like if you want to shove players yeah. either because they're having such a great time playing with themselves as it were like they're having such a great time uh <laughs> like chatting and role playing and all of that kind of stuff yeah. they're really not getting on with the plots or yeah. because they're so apprehensive and i've seen this with players before as well they're so apprehensive that they're just like they're doing more and more and more information gathering yes. rather than actually going and doing the thing because it's they're like so afraid just go to the hall just yeah. go you'll find right. out when you get to the hall yeah and you know as a writer that can also be a piece of a device that extends into that you can create a little section that is just like and here are some npcs who are here if you need yeah. them and then that can help it can help the gm it can help you as the writer you know keep things in that very uh rich self-contained world so the gm is not just pulling out a random you know person that they throw yeah. uh next to the group to get them going on things yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think having having an NPC that you can also add to the group, even if it's temporarily, even if it's like, oh, well, I'm going over there right now, I can show you the way. Yeah. Most parties yeah. don't say no to that. Uh, that's so that's true. another yeah. good way to like, get them out the door of the tavern and get them going towards the thing. <laughs> It's true. And also having, if you're doing a pre-gen situation or, or even if not, having the characters have some kind of personal connection to what it is that's going on can also be really helpful because then there's an inbuilt motivation for them to figure out what's happening, uh, you know, because they've got to figure out, well, why has their family been affected by this thing or why is their friends missing or, you know, whatever the situation is for the writing uh, that can also do a lot of the, your job for you. Um, sure. as the writer or as the GM to to get the, that train moving forward. Sure. So really working in those sort of personal stakes, essentially. <laughs> All righty then. Well, folks, just before we get to your questions, I would like to remind you that our second raffle is live. Oh, yeah. Exclamation point raffle to take part and win the World Anvil Anthology. Now, this is not from us. No, it is not. This was donated today by Stormbrill. Thank you so very much, Stormbrill, for donating this for the raffle. We will be sending you one copy of this. Uh, the, the marvelous beans behind the scenes will have the details on what format that will take, whether it will be digital or physical or what have you. But uh, yeah, that's what we're raffling off. Exclamation raffle to take part. It's full of incredible short stories of World Anvil Worlds. Yes, it is. Uh, so let's have a look at the questions for they are many and varied. Um, how much player choice is too much in a one shot? Ooh, wow, that's a good question. So I would wanna say if you're looking at the one shot, if you're looking at the story of the one shot and you're thinking of it like a flow chart, you don't wanna have more, I would say, oh, three tiers, three trees is a lot. If you're a really experienced GM, it's doable, but it's going to be really difficult. I would say probably two is the sweet spot where it's like choice A or choice B that are right in front of you. And then that also accommodates for what PCs do all the time, which is choice C. <clears throat> and then you've got to figure out how choice C sort of fits back into the tree as right. the GM. But I would say one or two sort of primary choices. You can uh, you can start a big fight, right? Uh, and resolve it in that way. Or you can use subterfuge to circumvent the fight. And then that's the way the next thing happens. Yeah, that would be, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. There was a great... Um... 
a great article I read years and years and years ago about choose your own adventure, which I think choose your own adventures have a lot to do with one shots. I think there's a lot of overlap because of that more linear space. Sure. And it described essentially, if you want your players to go from the field to the mountain, you can give them two or three options for the way that they can go there. They can go through the cave and fight this. They can go over the top of the mountain and fight this, or they can go by the river and fight that. Um, now that means when they arrive at the cave, they will have either item one, two, or three, because they've mm. been through either journey one, two, or three, but they still arrive at the top of the mountain, right? They yeah. still get to the same place. So I think that is a very good way to introduce choice. I think that is a very good idea, a good way to introduce the illusion that the choices also matter because they do arrive with a different thing that they wouldn't have got through a different way. Uh, mm. In my opinion, that's the most elaborate you can be with a one shot because they're one shots. Yeah, and that is that is actually quite elaborate for a one shot. And as you're writing something like that, that's also a lot of extra word count that uh, a third of that at least is not going to be used. Possibly two thirds yeah. of that is not going to be used. So what I would recommend is sort of being as being as like malleable as possible. You know, be jelly, right? Be jelly and just kind of like jiggle around and don't let the players know that it kind of doesn't matter if they would have went, uh, you know, through the cave or through the field. They were going to find the thing either way, but they did have the choice to go through the cave or the field. So when you're actually writing the encounter, you maybe you pick one sort of primary most groups are going to do this or this is the most obvious choice and here's you know all of these different encounter areas and a map that assumes what they're doing they can also choose to go through the field and here's some text about how to change this encounter that we've already let you know what that we've already written about and here's maybe an extra item or something that they can get but they're still getting to the next point and you're not you know exploding your word count and uh, causing a, a problem from a publishing perspective awesome awesome i love that um what is your advice for in media res one shots i can't explain to our beans what in media res means i think i missed your question i'm sorry there's a no no that's okay. No worries. So what is your advice for in media res one shots? And what is your, and can you explain to the beans what in media res actually means? Oh gosh. I'm not sure actually. <laughs> oh, okay. So in media res essentially is, uh, wait, am I, I'm pronouncing it in Italian Latin and that might not be, that might be throwing you off. So in media res. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so essentially it means starting your one shot right in the middle, in, in the middle of the action is what it means. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I actually think that that is the most effective way to do a one shot because the action is literally already happening and the characters have got to resolve a problem that is right in front of them. There is no tavern scene. There is no 30 minutes of figuring out how the party is going to work together um, and then getting them over to the encounter. It is right there and they have got to make a choice. And then their choices might, you know, the, the action will sort of like subside based on the scene just kind of coming to a natural end. And there will be time to discuss um, amongst the players what's going on and what's happening. And their choices may end up having effects that they don't necessarily see coming later down the road, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, so my advice is definitely focus on that big scene. Uh, have as much, um, you know, prologue text as you need about like what's going on and who the players are. And if you've got pregens how they're you know fitting into the scene and then you pass out the the pre-gen sheets or you you know have everybody introduce themselves if they've created characters and, and they sort of talk out of the game but then when the game starts then it's very much a okay right start you are on a spaceship and everything is looking like it's going fine you don't have any problems on the readouts you are just going to another another gig right your space opera stars and you're looking forward to meeting up with your fans again and then all of a sudden all of the dials start worrying and screaming and screeching and nobody is understanding what's going on your navigator is screaming this doesn't make any sense and then there's a blackout and then you wake up and yeah. you are in a room full of cages and each of you are in your own individual cage and there are strange uh, blue skin, pointy eared scientists in white lab coats milling about speaking a language that you barely recognize as something from across the galaxy. That's the way that you do that, right? And then the players have got an immediate problem. 
what just happened and how do we get out of here? What are they going to do to us? It really creates that tension that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, dropping your players in the problem or dropping the problem on their head mm -hmm. is an excellent way to start a one shot. Absolutely. So yeah, the in res approach can absolutely work. Mm. Um, and as Amanda said, if you go full chaos, rah, things happening, make sure they have a beat afterwards so that they can get the information. They can understand what the hook really is because sometimes when a dragon falls on your head, it's very un hard to understand what the hook is because all you see is the butt of a dragon descending on your head, right? So yeah, um, yeah just giving them that beat, I think is, is really valuable and have at it, go crazy. It's a one shot, one punch man. Yes. So we're talking about we're talking about ticking clocks later. You mentioned you know having that little downtime after the big opening scene um, yeah. in that type of one shot is very important. Having the downtime and having like some very natural oh here are things that you can find out through uh, you know you see uh, you see a symbol or you see a logo or something and you recognize it. Um, you saw it on some kind of hollow vid or something like that. Like having that situation. Um, is really uh, helpful because then the players are like, okay, well, we kind of have figured out what's happened and oh my gosh, it's really bad. How are we going to get out of here? And then they move on. Okay, I have a, a production fairy in my chat who says, you have a lot of questions. Alexandria is going to kill us if we don't let Amanda <laughs> get to her game. So you might need to do a fast lightning round for some of these questions. What do you think, Amanda? Are you up for a fast lightning round? Heck yeah, hit me. <laughs> Let's do it. If you provide pre-gen characters, how bland or unique should they be? Asks Dazzly Cat. I think they should be as unique as you want them to be. Uh, you can come up with all of the elements of their backstories. I really like making characters that are related to each other in some way, that are cousins or that are friends uh, or that are you know rivals and hate each other. Uh, it really creates uh, like an inbuilt story for your um, adventure. And so I think as unique as you can get them, while having it be a cohesive group, right? You want to give them reasons to be working together. There's got to be, you know, something uh, that makes them come together that can be in their backstory. And that's, yeah, that's my advice. Yeah, be absolutely. I would also add, if you're doing a one shot to introduce people to your setting, make sure that they are iconic characters within that setting or versions of the iconic characters within that yeah. setting so that people can really get a feel for what that is like. Um, sure. M. Gata says, I'm writing a combat light, villainless one shot. What would be your advice for a climax in this scenario? You have written yourself Ooh. into a corner, M. Gata. That is tough. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, no, actually, I think this is super fun. So you can have a big social event as your final encounter. So if it's villainless, right, if you're trying to, who knows what the PCs are trying to accomplish. Um, but if there's someone that they need to talk to or an audience they need to have, having that take place within the backdrop of something uh, really, uh, really dramatic, like a ball or or, you know, like uh, a session of the of the king or queen's court, uh, oh or um, a huge party, or a big rave, or a concert. Like these are all super fun things where social encounters can be really fun and important, and you can do really fun things with them. Like if you've got something set at a concert, uh, as different songs are playing, you can have a different mechanical benefits that are happening or you can have different things that are elapsing you can have the concert be the ticking clock uh, as as if you, something must be accomplished um, or figured out by the end of this concert or unbeknownstly the lead singer's head will explode who knows <laughs> what it is <laughs> um, uh, but yeah there's all kinds of cool things you can do when you're not looking at combat chat suggests dance off I love Dance it. Dance off. Oh, yeah. I can Ooh, love it. Perfect sort of sing off. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Battle of the Bards. Yeah. Uh, so, E Songbird says any suggestions for how to start a one shot? Time for players to introduce, interact to each other. So, we, we've talked about this. Um, well, their big concern is giving enough context, but not monologuing, essentially. Like how to deliver that crucial information. Yep. What are your thoughts? Any tips? Yeah, um, well, delivering delivering the crucial information, uh, I would say, is just being aware of sort of how much time is passing and uh, figuring out, like, okay, well, we're going to let them go. Sometimes it's literally a time situation. They've got five more minutes to mess around, and, you, and they don't know that they've got that amount of time, but they've got five more minutes until 
something's going to crash through the uh, doors of this tavern. Um, some big explosion outside is going to happen. Figure out, you know, a thing that you can do to kind of interrupt uh, what has become the derailment uh, of the opening scene and then just kind of go forward from there. Awesome. Uh, we have a question here um, from Secondhand Samurai who asks, what are your golden rules for writing a quick start for a world or setting compared to writing a, a one shot for a world or setting? Or do you not really separate them in your head? Oh, uh, the difference was uh, either a one shot or a campaign. Was that the, the question, the dichotomy there? So what are your golden rules for writing a quick start as opposed a to start. a one shot? Oh, certainly. So a quick start, I think, has got to hit on all the major elements that are making the setting unique. So anything that uh, would be noteworthy that is a a lot different from another setting, like the fact that there are no clerics uh, or divine magic, for example. Something that, you know, an average reader who's used to the sort of Tolkien-esque high fantasy would look at and go, oh, that's different. That's strange. Those are the things you really want to highlight in the quick start guide. The one-shot module, you specifically don't want to do that because then that leads to all kinds of, uh, like I had mentioned, ways for the players to go off track and think that those things are significant when really it's just mm. world building. Um, so what you probably want to do there is Maybe if it's a new setting, pick one thing that makes it really unique and have the module really go into that. And uh, that's really fun because it, very much like a novel in a shared world, that can introduce players to these unique elements of the game to really make them come to life and make them interested in your setting. Very cool. Very cool. Um, question from Benka now, personal question. Do you have a favorite system outside of Pathfinder and D&D? &D? Oh my gosh, I have played so many different games. I have to say that I'm a really big fan of the Blades in the Dark uh, scene mm -hmm. system that they've got going on. So um, yeah, that really allows for role playing and there's a rewind element to it as well, where something happens and you say, uh, stop. Oh, well, my character has got, you know, a knife on their belt uh, and they're gonna take that out because they anticipated that there would be somebody who was gonna menace them. And then the system kind of allows you to, uh, as the GM, figure out, well, how likely is that? Uh, if it's unlikely, you know, you have got to push yourself and make a die roll. If it's perfectly reasonable, sure, you've got a dagger on your belt. I really like that, um, especially for one shots, because it allows resolution uh, in a way that's very uh, sort of GM friendly. Um, and you can, as long as you can roll with punches, it's a very good system. Awesome. Blades in the dark, guys. Check it out. Uh, lots of people in the chat saying, it, chat saying it is very awesome. So there we go. Lots and lots of uh, accolades for that. Yeah, evil has... Is, oh, sorry. Is a session zero still worth having with a one shot? So should you do a session zero with a one shot? So I would say it kind of depends on what it is you want to run. Um, if you are, if you've got a long-term gaming group that you've been playing with for a long time, and you're just running something and... Uh, you know, it, it could very much just be a situation of, hey, I want to run a Weird West game for everybody. Uh, are you cool with that? Uh, are you cool with uh, this sort of thing and kind of briefly outline what it is? Then that's perfectly fine. But if you're running something that's real niche in the genre, or if you're specifically running horror, which by the way, horror is fantastic for one shots. Some of my best and favorite horror games ever have been one shots that are extremely memorable and will be for years to come for me personally, are horror one shots. You do probably want to have either a session zero or you want to have some kind of like group discussion where everybody's talking on Discord or everybody, you know, has gotten on the same page so that you know, any kind of safety tools can be discussed, uh, general content can be discussed to make sure everybody is on board and, um, you know, nobody's going to uh, end up getting um, taken out of the game and, and not having fun because, you know, the purpose is having fun. So yes, it is worth it. It just kind of depends on what it is you're looking uh, at running as, as far as how robust that, so that session might be. Awesome, awesome. And you guys, safety tools, check them out. Very, very important, very, very useful. Um, help people have fun. Yes, um, sure. my final question was also going to was also <laughs> asked by Red Mage Chris. There we go. But so basically, we have a lot of people in the World Anvil community who are world building and writing for fun, and we have people who are already <laughs> writing professionally and and publishing and you know writing for for RPGs. So, what advice would you give for somebody who wants to make that transition? 
somebody who is interested in writing professionally in the RPG space. And I realize, as Alexander said, could very easily do an entire panel on this, and I'm oh, giving yes. you not very long to answer. <laughs> but in general, do you have any any sort of advice for people who want to make that step? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, write your own stuff a lot, which sounds like you folks probably already are. Um, have it played, sort of have a sense of <clears throat> how players tend to interact with your work. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> because it is different, right? Depending on the writer, uh, you know, there are things that are in your head that are not necessarily expressed super well to um, other players. <clears throat> but <clears throat> oh, I'm dying. It's probably oh, my game group, right? <laughs> Like they're hexing you they're hexing yeah, you hexing me <laughs> um but yeah so just kind of get a sense of what you as a writer tend to express really well and what um, players tend to have trouble picking up on and uh you know improving that from a, a kind of a personal homebrew gm situation uh and then you know a lot of it is, is about um just sort of having that experience and starting to get some some writer credit so look for very small um, types of assignments that you can get, make connections with professionals if you can in the business, uh, go to panels that are all about getting started uh, in writing. There's Freelancing 101 is a panel that has been used across multiple systems with lots of professionals that have all kinds of tips about this entire subject. Um, but, you know, start out small. Uh, I would say, like, don't bite off more that you, than you can chew and sort of, like, understand that there is a building process that happens with experience before you uh, start to try to run, before you want to write a whole huge module and say that's your goal. Well, that's not going to happen right out the gate. And if it does, it actually might be a bad thing because you haven't learned those lessons that you learn when you're doing the smaller assignments here and there and working sort of with the professionals and and understanding just the differences right between writing for publication and writing for homebrew yeah absolutely any tips on those first steps on finding those sort of first connections with small houses do you just randomly cold call people do you write to them do you send unsolicited adventures how how do you do that so you don't send unsolicited adventures because almost every company can't actually look at unsolicited material because it's a legal concern. Uh, I never have worked at a company where I've actually been able to open a thing because the legal concern is if you do and then something that you publish in a year happens to have something in common with that, it's going to be entirely a coincidence, but that's a difficult thing to prove legally and then yeah. you have opened yourself up to liability and your company. So do not do that. <laughs> Good. That's what um, I was going, hoping you would say. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Going to conventions is a fantastic way to, to do that and just making contact with individuals. The RPG business is so wonderful in that so many of us are just everywhere and very, you know, all pretty much all companies are really approachable. Uh, and, you know, putting yourself out there and having a business card and presenting yourself as a professional at a convention goes a really, really long way. And the business is always looking for writers um, you know, being as professional as you can, as you're getting, you know, little assignments uh, will immediately catapult you up to the top of the list because there's lots and lots of folks who want to write, but not necessarily lots of folks who can adhere to a lot of those professional standards. Um, but yeah, going to conventions, uh, panels, um, there are a number of um, panels that are, are posted sort of online and people will say, hey, here's my email. I work for this company. Uh, doing all of that kind of research, even if you can't go to conventions, is going to be the way to identify uh, who some of those folks are and, and what you would be best suited for. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that information, because I know that we have a lot of people sitting there thinking, I want to take the next step and I don't know how. So that was yep. really, really helpful. All right, Amanda, it the time has come for you to tell us what is coming out next. What is your thing? What do you want to oh, share with us? Oh my gosh. So there is a book coming out that some of you might have heard. It's a fifth edition book called Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and it will be released on May 18th of this year. So yeah, fairly quickly. And uh, I've written a bit uh, of it. It's got a wonderful cast of authors, uh, some of whom are, uh, most of whom are, you know, very top tier. Some of the best horror writers that you can possibly get have put together uh, this uh, wonderful new update to the Ravenloft campaign setting. There are little adventures that you can take part in all of the uh all of the realms of Ravenloft are detailed in full and it's just a super exciting beautiful book um Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft May 18th exciting and I am to know that some of those writers are also Anvilites so I'm definitely looking forward yes. to checking it out 
It was the same with candle, candle keep mysteries. I looked at the writers and I was like, oh, these are our beans. And I got so yeah. overexcited. We love so working overexcited. Beans. <laughs> <laughs> we do have the best beans. And speaking of best beans, Amanda, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate coming on here and I'd be happy to come back anytime. Yay! That's what I was hoping you would say. <laughs> um, Amanda, it's always so fun to talk to you. So thank you for your sage advice. Thank you also, everybody who came, sat in the chat, uh, was hilarious, made astute observations, asked excellent questions, and generally was great company. Um, I would also like to thank Secondhand Samurai and Demetrius, who have been our behind the scenes beans today. They have been getting me questions, telling me that I'm blocking the anvil shield. There it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, generally, generally helping out, making sure that uh, everything runs smoothly. I would also like to thank for the subs, the Painted Cat, Danny Adventures, Zoroth Dev, Steph Dragon, the Painted Cat again, Steph Dragon again, Danny Adventures again. Holy moly, it has been a sub filled session. Thank you guys. For the bits, Kajan, Lady Vader, uh, Val B. Gem, Dazzly Cat, Zoroth Dev, Steph Dragon, Danny Adventures, Mergendor, and Anonymous Chura. Steph Dragon, Eric, Syracuse, and Danny Adventures. Thank you everyone for the follows and hosts. We are going on a raid. We are raiding Time Pool. Yeah, we are. Time Pool, you'll find him at twitch.tv forward slash time pool or stay exactly where you are and uh, shout out, light up the forge when you get there to let him know that we sent you. We'll be live at the normal time next week. So that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday when we have Duke Davis from One Shot Questers coming on to talk to us about one shots, because that's what he does. Yes, it is. Um, in the meantime, I would like to wish you a very happy time zone. And I would like to invite you to grab your hammer and go world built. <laughs> <laughs>